panic mode every time a, a boom happens. So <laughs> some of you have dogs like that too. <laughs> Who will be a witness? Before we begin, of course, we're going to take some time and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. For spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And if we want to understand what God has for us, I believe this with all my heart, mind, and soul. That's why I call 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14 my anchor text. Because it teaches the principles whereby we approach the Word of God. And that is prayerfully asking for God's Holy Spirit to speak to hear. Because my words don't mean anything. But the Holy Spirit taking human words can make something really special. Can challenge your heart. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had people come up to me and say, after, a, after I'd spoken somewhere and they say, wow, that was, that really touched my heart and they say something that I didn't even talk about. And the Holy Spirit just told them something totally different and just touched their heart and that's what they needed that day. And so I just want to invite each one of us, uh, old, young, every one of us in this room, to just ask God to speak to our hearts. And uh, let's see, let's see what he does. And... Uh, I'll have an out loud prayer after we just pray for a minute here. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would come into this place in an extra powerful way, Lord. I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Lord, uh, it's not about me. It's not about any one of us in here, Lord. It's about you and what you want to do in our lives and in the lives of our families, in the lives of our communities, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord that you would send your angels that excel in strength to take away the distractions that are holding us back from hearing the messages that you have for us today. Lord, I pray that you would take me, Lord, the humble vessel, Lord, hide me behind your cross, that you might be lifted up, Lord. Make me a mirror that I might reflect your character. Make each one of us a mirror to reflect you. Lord, I pray that you would give me freedom to speak and that you would... Um, give us ears to hear in your name. I pray these things. Amen. You remember the day you gave your life to Jesus? What happened afterward? Or the, the time, some, for some it's kind of instant, some it's, it's more of a progression. You know, some have the Paul experience, some have the Apostle John experience, Right? But that time that you gave your life to Jesus, I, I mean, I know what happened to me. I wanted everybody to know that life is better with Jesus. I mean, it became the consuming desire of my heart. I looked at the, the, my family members that weren't walking with the Lord. Man, Lord, I want them to walk with you. I don't know, I don't know why I've waited so long. This is so much better with you. I remember the, the praying for the, my classmates that lived in my hall in the dorm at the college and, and just asking for God to work in their lives. I wanted them to know and to experience Jesus. Can anybody relate to that? Some of you can. Praise the Lord. I begin to, to seek his word like never before. I began to read through the word of God. And it what had been like a chore. Anybody found the Bible reading a chore? Don't raise your hand. But maybe, but you know what I'm talking about. You're doing it out of duty, out of, out of obligation because your mom or your dad made you when you were a kid. Instead of that being the case, it became a delight to read the word. It, se it seemed like everything I would read, God was just speaking directly to my heart. It was like God was talking to me personally. It was like my eyes were just opened. 
And I, I begin to re realize that as I, I would underline these things, but I realized that I, I wouldn't remember them. And so I'd go and I'd, I decided I'm going to just type out every single quote that I've underlined. For, for me, I was looking for where do I see the love of God. That was like the theme of the first time I read through the Bible, all the way from front to back. And I was like, where do I see the love of God? And, and so I said, well, how can I stop forgetting these things? I know. I'm going to go and type them up. So I begin to type up the quotes. Yeah, those of you that are young and you need to learn how to, your typing skills, read the Bible and then type out your, the quotes of what you read. By the time I finished doing that, I, I did that with Desire of Ages too. By the time I, I had finished typing out the quotes from the Bible um, of everything I underlined from Genesis to Revelation, I had over 100 single-spaced pages of, of quote, quotes. I had over 80-some pages of quotes from the Desire of Ages that I had typed out by hand because I didn't want to forget them. And my, now those of you guys that are in school, you'll like this. My typing speed went from uh, about 25 words a minute to about 100 words per minute. <laughs> I got really fast. <laughs> it was incredible. And, uh, and, and it was just like everything was just speaking directly to, to me and it was like I was just like, Wanted, my focus was on the Lord and being closer to Him. I wanted to actually pray. It wasn't a chore. It was my delight. And I especially began to pray for God to pour out His Holy Spirit upon my heart. Can anybody relate to my experience? That's my story. Maybe you can relate to that. We might call it the honeymoon. Now, I don't suggest to you guys that are going to be going to school to do this, but... Um, <laughs> as I as I was seeking the Lord uh, you know it was, I went into the spring quarter I was on a quarter system at the university I was at and as I was seeking the Lord I mean I, I would spend two hours in the morning reading the Bible the spirit of prophecy I would spend another hour and a plus in prayer and and sometimes I wouldn't finish my homework and it was not I mean I was always a good student in school and Got really good grades, but it was crazy. Um, this never happens in college. I think I've maybe shared this with you before, but when, when I'd go to class and I hadn't finished my assignment, I'm like, man, you know, I put God first, and I'd, I'd, I'd go to class, and the professor, without me saying a thing, would say, you know, we're going to extend the day. We're going to extend the day for that assignment one more time. I mean, every single time. I didn't have a missing assignment. I don't believe that quarter. And I didn't have a late assignment. The Lord, the Lord knew. It was just like the Lord knew. It was like this wonderful honeymoon experience with the Lord. <laughs> and uh, granted, it was one of my best grade-wise quarters I'd ever had in college. So with that in mind, I'm not bragging. Can you relate? The desire for souls became the burden of my heart. Turn with me if you have your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. James just read this with us. But this is, this is, to me, one of the most incredible passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah, a young person being called to the prophetic ministry. And it starts by saying, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. These are the covering angels in the presence of God. In the throne room of God. Notice what they say. And, and one cried, verse 3, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his what? glory the whole earth is full of his glory Lord give me eyes to see your glory because sin has sure marred a lot of things and then in verse 4 it says and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the whole and the house was filled with smoke we get this picture of the temple in the in heaven Isaiah sees God on his throne he sees the seraphim, the angels around the, around the throne of God. 
praising the Lord. Now, it's interesting that if you go to Ezekiel 1, you see a similar thing in greater detail. The same four angels, the same things being said. You see it in Revelation 4 as well. Turn with me just real quick to Revelation 4. This is really interesting. Keep your finger in Isaiah 6. Revelation 4. Hundreds of years later, the apostle John again sees the Lord on his throne. And notice the similarities to what we just read in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. After these things I looked, Revelation 4, verse 1. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a what? Trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, it says in verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne and he who sat on his sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now, it's very, very similar to the description of Ezekiel 1. Now, notice what's around the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had gold crowns on their head. Now, this is new. You don't see this in Isaiah. Well, without going into great detail, these are, the, these are some of the first fruits that the Lord took with him back to heaven at the cross, after the resurrection at the cross. Uh, anyway, going on from there. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were how many living creatures? Four living creatures full of eyes, in front and in back. The first creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And by the way, those are the, those are the four faces that are described in Ezekiel chapter 1. Now go to verse 8. This is what we, we saw this in, um, in Isaiah chapter 6. The four living creatures, each having how many wings? Six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. Now notice what they're saying. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is, who was and is and is to come. They're praising the Lord. Hundreds of years later, they're still there praising the Lord. Whenever the living creatures, notice what it says, give what? Glory. Glory. And honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before their throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they exist. Now, if you went to Revelation 5, you would see those 24 elders were, were, were redeemed from the earth. That's why we know that these are the first fruits um, there. But it's interesting to see this parallel in Revelation chapter 4 and Ezekiel 1. We won't take the time to look at Ezekiel 1 today. Um, But I encourage you to do it. You also see this in Daniel chapter 7. Some of the same things being alluded to. Um, Pretty fascinating. Now let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. And let's notice. So Isaiah beholds, I guess what I'm trying to have everybody understand is that Isaiah beholds the glory of the Lord. Have you beheld the glory of the Lord? What happens when we behold the glory of the Lord? Keep that in the back of your thoughts here. Notice what Isaiah says. He beholds the glory of the Lord. Now it it must be veiled because the Lord had said to Moses, what did the Lord say to Moses when the Lord, when Moses asked him, Lord, show me your glory. Do you remember? He said, no man can see my glory and live. He says, but I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand, and I'm going to let you see my back. And the glory was too overwhelming. He couldn't look. He was face down on the ground. Notice what Isaiah says as he beholds the glory in some sort of masked form. Verse 5, Isaiah 6, verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
God and his glory and his perfection in contrast to our uncleanness, we could use the word, the fact that we're sinners. In the midst of a sinful people, to behold the glory of the Lord. And, and Isaiah says, I'm undone. It's interesting to me to see the contrast between a holy and glorified God, the sinless angels and ourselves. It's striking. I believe it always leads to the conclusion of our own unworthiness. Isaiah experiences this, our own uncleanness, our own sinfulness. There's a sense of condemnation of the sin that is within our lives. Has anyone else ever experienced that? Isaiah is not alone. Scripture testifies to many that have experienced this. Consider the story of Manoah and his wife. Who is Manoah's son, the famous son? The strongest man that ever lived. Samson. Manoah's wife is visited by an angel of the Lord is what the Bible says. We come to find out later on that it is the Lord himself. It's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that visits his wife, and she says, hey, this angel came and said, I'm going to have a son. And Manoah says, well, let's, let's pray and ask the, the Lord will bring him again. So she, he shows up again. She goes and gets Manoah, the husband, and they go and they, and they meet with this angel, and he tells him, hey, you're, not gonna, you're gonna have a son. Don't drink, any, don't drink any wine, no strong drink. You can read about this in Judges chapter 13. And Manoah says, well, let us prepare for you food. I mean, it would be terribly rude in a Middle Eastern culture to not give food to a guest. And so he says, well, I won't eat with you, but if you want to do something, give an offering. And so he, he gets an offering, and they give this burnt offering. And <laughs> the angel of the Lord touches the offering, and it goes up into fire, and he goes up to heaven in the fire, and, and Manoah immediately exclaims, Woe is me, for we have seen the Lord, we're going to die. We've seen God face to face. And his wife says, Wait a minute, why would the Lord bring us this good news if he wants to kill us? <laughs> you know, we're going to have a son. Think of, consider Daniel by the Ulai River in Daniel chapter 10. As he has the vid vision, he says, My strength is left left me I have nothing left in me and he has to be strengthened by the angel consider Peter and the catch of fish in Luke chapter 5 verse 8 Luke chapter 5 verse 8 <laughs> this one is he's meeting with Jesus who's put on humanity and yet as he beholds what Christ has done he's convinced of his glory and he does something to me is absolutely fascinating Luke chapter 5 verse 8 when Peter saw it, this great catch of fish that the Lord had said to do, I mean an impossible catch of fish. You don't fish during the day because the fish can see the net. And the Lord says, cast your net on the other side of the boat, remember, and he catches all the fish. And in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He's convicted of his sinfulness and yet he falls down right at his knees. He doesn't want to leave, but he, but he recognizes his sinfulness. And it's interesting, at the very end, Jesus says to him, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And he gives him his call to go out and reach others. Peter, James, and John were absolutely overwhelmed at the transfiguration. Remember the story up on, on the top of the mountain when Elijah and Moses meet with Jesus. It says they fall down on their face. Peter starts blabbing. Bl you know, some people, when they get scared, they go, and they just stop, right? Other people, when they get scared, they just start talking. Have you ever met someone that just starts talking when they're scared? <laughs> that was Peter. <laughs> anyway, they get there, and Peter's like, well, Lord, let's just build you a shelter, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And then the Lord says, the, the Father says to Jesus, say, this is my beloved son, hear him. <laughs> and they fall down Paul on the road to Damascus falls down on his face as he, hear, as he sees the vision it's, it, it goes beyond just the biblical stories Martin Luther he finds the word of God as he's at the university and he begins to read the word of God and as he reads the word of God he's convicted that he is a sinner 
when we come up face to face with the Lord, His glory, the conviction that we are a sinner, a, a, a man or a woman of unclean lips will settle upon our hearts. I can, I can say that happened to my experience. Any, can anybody else testify of their experience? As, you got, as, you come, as you're coming to the Lord, before you accept the Lord, you're, you're convicted that your unrighteousness is beyond help without Jesus. Let's continue on in, this, in the passage. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. Now this is really interesting to me. Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me, having in his hand, what does he have in his hand? A live coal. So he's holding this coal, burning with fire, which he had taken, from the, taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, now, this is clearly symbolic because you clearly wouldn't want a live coal touching your lips, right? But he touches him with the live coal from the altar. And he says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is what? Taken away, hallelujah. And your sin purged. He is, he is cleansed from a live coal from the altar of heaven. Now that's fascinating. How is our sin taken away? In Jesus, right? Jesus Christ takes away our sin. We repent. We turn from our sins. We're baptized, a symbol of dying with Christ and being raised to a new life. And the Bible promises that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Now turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 3. Why does, why does Isaiah 6 use this sim idea of a live coal? Now this passage used to really confuse me. Matthew chapter 3, and we'll pick up the story there with John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to get to the, the culmination point, which is down at the bottom of the, of the passage there in, in verse 12. So starting in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, what does he say? Repent. This is, where, this is where it begins. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And now John himself was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went to him and were baptized, him, uh, baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now it's interesting, notice who else shows up. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he warned them, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. This isn't a, this isn't a show, in other words. This isn't for show. This is, this is something deeper than that. This isn't for the sake of criticism. What does he tell them? He says, verse 8, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to say to yourselves we have Abraham as our father for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire now listen to this this is where it gets really interesting this is where it explains what's going on in Isaiah 6 I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he who is coming after me is what? Mightier than I. As, as a Christian, our job is to point to the one that is always mightier than us. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. There's one coming after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with what? Well, the Holy Spirit first and then with fire. Now that's interesting. And then it goes on to say, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And I always thought, boy, this sounds so warm and fuzzy until you get to the fire part and this burning part. That doesn't sound 
that warm and fuzzy. <laughs> what is that about? Why does Jesus want to baptize us with fire? Well, what's a winnowing fan? Let's start with the winnowing fan. A winnowing fan was a tool. Uh, it was a giant fan. They would take the wheat to the threshing floor and they would beat the wheat out after they had harvested. They would beat the wheat with sticks and it would knock the kernels of wheat out onto the ground. And so now you've got all this stubble, this straw, all these different things there in the threshing floor and they need to go away. Well, the kernel of wheat is surrounded by chaff. Anyone ever, anyone ever um, just like uh, harvested wheat just with your hands? Anybody ever done that? Okay, one person? Oh, man, this is, it's really fun. You can like chew it up and it turns into like a, almost like a gum or actually making gluten in your mouth is what you're doing. But anyway, uh, I used to do this a lot in college because there are wheat fields everywhere. And uh, they would all, inevitably there would be wheat just growing on the sides of the road that had spilled out of the trucks and we'd go pick it and we'd rub off the, rub off the chaff, the outer part of the wheat berries and then we'd go like this. I'd have it in a cup in my palm and I'd pour it from this palm into the other palm and as I'm doing it, I would essentially, I would use my mouth as a winnowing fan. I would go, I would blow. And as I blew, the, the berries, which are heavy, would fall down, the wheat kernels, and the chaff would blow away. So what, what's going on with this winnowing fan is as the wheat is being moved, the winnowing fan is blowing away the chaff. And after a while, if you've harvested a big field of it, you're going to have quite a bit of chaff. So they would bind it up, bu bundle it up with the straw that they had gathered. They would bundle up the chaff and they would burn it. It's a good, quick way to get rid of it. And it burns really, really well. And so he would clean the wheat berries. And, not, and at the end of it, what's left is just pure wheat. Beautiful, pure wheat. Now, why does Jesus say he wants to burn this up? Well, if we think about this, what does God want to do? When we give our life to him, does he want to transform our life or does he want us to stay exactly the same the rest of the time? That he wants to change us, right? He wants to sanctify us. He wants to cleanse us from our sin. He wants to change our desires so that what I once was, I no longer am. And so here, he says, I'm going to baptize you with fire. What if, what if the chaff in our life, what if the chaff in our life is sin? And, Cl and Christ wants to take that out of your life, burn it up so that it can never come back again. Here, Isaiah, touched with a live coal from the altar in heaven, his sin is purged. Jesus baptizes with fire, our sin is purged. He gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us to go out and be a witness. Now notice what happens in Isaiah 6, verse 8. To me, this is one of the most powerful things. So Isaiah is given a picture of the gospel. The Lord takes away his sin in Isaiah chapter 6 and immediately something happens and this is where we're going with this. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And so our sin is taken away. When our sin is taken away, what, what, what comes onto the heart? A desire for souls. And so Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. So my question is simple. Have you given your life to Jesus? Has he cleansed you from sin? Are you answering his call to you. How are you answering his call? Is there a burden on your heart for souls like never before? And if so, what are you doing about it? Let me read you this statement from Steps to Christ. This is an incredible statement from Steps to Christ. This is page 78 of Steps to Christ. So those who are the partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice. That others for whom he died may share the heavenly gift. They will do all they can to make the world better for their stay in it. This spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. 
Now, this, this next part is just incredibly powerful. No sooner does one come to Christ and there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. If we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. Incredible. Who's going to be a witness? Has Christ touched your heart? Will you? Will I? I mean, that's really, what, that's really the question. You know, we have evangelistic series coming up. Are you willing to be a witness? Are you willing to invite somebody? You may say, well, how can I be a witness? I don't have the gift of preaching. I don't, I don't want to get up front and teach. I just want to, I just want to give you three, three simple ways that you can be a witness for the Lord to just consider. Number one, ask God. We all have the privilege of working for Him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, ask, and it will be what? Given to you. Seek, and you might find. Is that what it says? No, it says you will find. You shall find. Knock, and if he feels like it, he's going to open it. What does it say? It says, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Have you asked the Lord how he wants you to be a witness? Some have felt like, I don't have what it takes. Well, maybe just ask him and see what he says. It is our privilege to commune directly with the Lord. We don't have to go through somebody else. God wants to speak directly to us. Friends, I, I believe there's nothing more exciting than doing what God has asked us to do. Nothing more exciting. Number two, pray for the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus wants to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Pray for the Holy Spirit. He will empower you through the Holy Spirit with His gifts and His fruits. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. If you, if you have these in your life, people are going to want to be around you. People are going to want to say, why are you so different? Why do you have peace when nobody else has peace? Why do you have faith when nobody else has faith why do you love when they're rude to you you know they're going to look and see why are you different but he also gives us gifts now this is really important as we pray for the holy spirit he's going to empower you with gifts sometimes i mean i even i even thought it i, I thought well if i want to i just knew i wanted to serve the lord when i when the lord changed my life and i said i guess i got to go study theology and be a pastor and coming out of college, the Lord said, no, you're going to go be a teacher. For 13 years, I taught. I loved it. It was wonderful. And, I, and I, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, it's so clear you called me into teaching. When you called me into teaching, it has to be just as clear when you call me into pastoring. And it was. The Lord said, I want you to go be a pastor now. It was crystal clear. But not everybody's called to the same things. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We won't read the whole thing, but just a, just a couple little snippets here. Looking at spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll pick it up in verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the what? The same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all 
in all. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of how many? Of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through another through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It's okay if we have different gifts. But God is calling us to use our gifts for him that he's empowering us through the Holy Spirit. Skip over to verse 27. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church first. Apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? We have different gifts that God has given us. This is not a comprehensive list. If you go throughout the Bible, there's, there's many, more other, uh, many other spiritual gifts that are given. No gift is less important than the other. Uh, there's no limit to what you can, uh, what you can do when we're, when, we're, when we're filled with the Spirit of God. Are you willing to be a witness for Him? Ask him, what does he want you to do? Pray for God's Holy Spirit to empower you. Number three, pray for God to put people in your path to witness to by living the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. Notice verse 31 in chapter 12. Notice what 30, 31 says. But earnestly desire the what? The best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. So, of all the gifts, this is the premier gift. This is a gift that God's Holy Spirit wants every single one of us to have. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have, gift, though I have the gift of prophecy and have and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love I am how much? I'm nothing and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but have not love it profits me nothing friends can we love one another? Yes. we can right? Yes. can we love our community? Can we love our family? Can we set aside the, the, the difficulties and love one another? Can we love the unlovable? We all have them, right? Think of, think of the unlovable in your life. <laughs> we all have them. Can you love the unlovable? Well, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, we sure can. Notice it goes on to say, love suffers long. And it's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. And I love verse 7. It says it bears all things. How often do we get offended over some little thing? Lord, give me more love. <laughs> so I can suck up my pride a little bit bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love sometimes fails. Is that what it says? How often does love fail? Never fails. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. That is, they're going to come to a close. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now I love verse 11 and 12. 
When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then what's the promise? Face to face. Oh, that I could see him face to face. Face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know just as I also am known. How much does God know about you? Does he know you better than you know you? He does. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Hallelujah. Go live love. Pray for God to put people in your path that you might love them. If I go out and I teach them the Sabbath, but I don't love them, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. If I teach him the state of the dead, but I, don't teach, but I don't show him love, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. If I teach him all the prophecies of, of Daniel and Revelation, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, etc., but I don't give him love, what am, I show, what am I doing? It's like a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. I believe as we surrender to him, as we love people, God will put people in your path. that you can be a witness to, that you can love and you can show the love of Jesus to. Lord, give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Friends, I believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe that with all my heart. Oh, how sweet that day is going to be. I mean, it's, I believe it's almost time for him to come. I really believe that. This world is waxing old like a garment, if you will. And people need to know Jesus is coming soon. They need to know he loves them. They need to know that Christ died for them. They need to know the truths of the Bible. The Sabbath and so, and, and so forth. We don't have any time to lose. Who's going to be the witness? Who's going to be the, the loving witness to go out and call people into the, into the fold? May our answer be, here I am, Lord, send me. I can only answer for me, you know? May, maybe the Lord's going to put someone in your path and you're going to say, hey, why don't, you come, why don't you come to this evangelistic series? How hard is that? What's the only risk? Well, they might say no. <coughs> okay. Is that, is that any loss? <coughs> if you don't invite them, they're not coming either. But what if they say yes and they come and they give their life to Jesus? Their life <laughs> will be totally different and they're going to go out and win souls for the kingdom. I have a simple appeal. Number one, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus. And by the way, I believe this is not just a one-time thing. How often do we need to give our lives to Jesus? Every single day. Daily I need to be surrendered to him. I say this all the time because I believe it's the truth. Paul says, I die daily. Jesus says, take up the cross daily and follow me. That's the way the Luke version puts it. Take up the cross daily and follow him. Give your life to Jesus. What do you got to lose? <laughs> Maybe a little pain, a little sorrow. You might lose those things. What do you have to gain? What's that? <laughs> A whole lot of sin. I could I'd love to lose all those things. The bigger appeal is, is for those that have given their life to Jesus already. Are you willing to commit yourself to be a witness for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? It's your privilege. So ask him, Lord, how do you want me to witness today? If tomorrow comes, you can worry about tomorrow. Pray for the Holy Spirit. He will empower you with, with spiritual gifts to witness the best way possible. Three, pray for God to put people in your path. You know? Jesus is coming soon. And we don't have any time to lose. Our, let's pray and then we'll do our closing song. Father in heaven, you've heard my appeal 
We know you're coming soon, Lord, and it's time to be serious about walking with you. Lord, the cry of my heart is, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me out into your field, Lord. Send me out into your harvest field that I might be a witness for you. Lord, I pray that each one of us would respond to that call, Lord, whether we're young or whether we're old. We can do something for you, Lord, by your grace, by your power, by your spirit. Send us, Lord. Shake us up, challenge us, help us to grow. It's my prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing song today is, Tis Almost Time for the Lord to Come. We're, we're changing it because I picked a song that nobody knew. So, <laughs> so we're, that's, that's song number 212. Would you stand with us? <laughs>